So, hello friends. So, I'll be just giving a sort of a staggered overview on uh, this nice sort of a review article that came in 2025 uh, on nine myths about enteral feeding in critically ill adults. Uh, so, it is a good review article. So, I would suggest all trainees to just glance through this. There's nothing new, but it just re-emphasizes uh, the sort of uh, the summary message in each of the dimensions of nutritional practices. So it just takes you through some of the key studies that have led to certain practices in nutrition as uh, endorsed by various organizations like Aspen, ESPEN, or so on and so forth. So what I have done is there are around nine myths they have spoken about. So today I'll be just giving a brief overview on, on the first myth. And subsequently, I'll cover the other uh, eight myths uh, in maybe two to three videos. So the first myth is about uh, early enteral nutrition. So the recommendation one that came from this review article is in patients who are admitted to intensive care unit, provided there are no contraindications. So patients have to be initiated on enteral nutrition with enteral nutrition on admission. So that was the message and I think most intensivists or intensive care practitioners who are listening to this know for sure that it is a well-established fact that we need to feed the patients when they come to ICU as early as possible. So if you look at Australian guidelines, they suggest it should be within 24 hours. If you look at uh, American or European guidelines, they suggest 24 to 48 hours. So, so that is the norm. So ASAP, as soon as possible, the feeds have to be initiated. But the second important aspect possibly which needs to be dawned upon or all our practitioners have clarity is enteral nutrition with low to moderate calories and low to moderate protein to start off as a target is what has been suggested. And I'll take you through certain evidence that has led to this concept that we don't feed patients with high calories at the outset or high proteins at the uh, outset. And you've seen multiple videos I've done on nutrition where we go on a step ladder approach. We start with 25% of the nutritional goals on day one, slowly increase it to reach to around 100% after day four or at day four. So something like, so that is the norm. So that we will talk about because there are few landmark articles. So why is it enteral nutrition preferred? I think we have understood that uh, the trophic uh, feed that we give helps in the release of trophic substrates which are protective in nature and it helps in maintaining the gut associated lymphoid tissue and some immunomodulant effect when you start feeding early and early feeding tends to maintain gut microbiota and it tends to de-emphasize on parenteral nutrition because enteral nutrition would, once they're tolerating, obviously, you wouldn't look or think of parental nutrition. So the norm is if the gut works, please use it. That's the norm. And uh, when we say early, then we have to look into the guidelines. So if you look at the ESPEN, European Society of Parental Enteral Nutrition, Canadian Critical Care Guidelines, the suggestion is one has to start feeding within 24 to 48 hours after admission to ICU. When you look at Aspen, American Society and Society of Critical Care Medicine, suggestion is feeding has to be initiated within 24 to 48 hours after admission. When you look at Australasian guidelines, suggestion is within 24 hours after admission. So these are some of the recommendations that have come. For all the listeners, keep it in mind, if gut is working, start as soon as possible rather than any further delay. And if you look at the evidence, the, the, these are the key sort of, most of the landmark articles that have come is from Darren Hayland. So just focus on the second meta-analysis of seven randomized controlled trials, 440 patients. They looked at one group where enteral nutrition was given within 48 hours and they compared with the second group which got delayed enteral nutrition. And the risk of infection was significantly less in the group which got early enteral nutrition. So this was very clearly established. Then they looked at mortality again by this group. So 14 randomized controlled trials, 670 patients. So if you see the mortality, the signal is towards lesser mortality. If you see 10% versus 20, but it, it did not attain statistical significance in this meta-analysis. Then there was this study from Belgium and Netherlands, which is little recent. So this came out in 2016, which showed that ICU length of stay was significantly less 
in the group which got early enteral nutrition as opposed to delayed enteral nutrition. So these are some of the studies which point towards benefit of early enteral nutrition. Then we need to speak about the latest that has come out in early enteral nutrition because of the second statement I made where we need to focus on low calorie and little low protein at the outset and then crank it up towards ICU discharge. You go up to the whatever suggested goals that you have is the norm. That gain predominantly from this particular trial, which every trainee should know. This was a nutri ria trial, which came in Lancet Respiratory Medicine in 2023 by the French group. If you look at the title, low versus standard calorie and protein feeding in ventilated. So these were the sick patients, like typical patients we treat. They were sick patients who were ventilated with shock, multicenter, open label, parallel group trial. So the hypothesis in this trial was early restrictive. So here they restricted the group with calories and proteins in one group. So where, so what is the normal calories suggested? We suggest 20 to 25 kilocalories per kg per day. What is the proteins we, uh, the guideline suggest? 1.2 to 2 grams per kg per day. Here they restricted that in the sick patients early on and they compared with standard. And the hypothesis was that early restrictive improves outcome. So this was a multicentric randomized control trial, quite a big trial, 61 ICOs in the France, done between 5th July 2018 to 8th December 2020. So here they took the sickest of the patients, more than 18 years, who were ventilated, who were on vasopressors. They were sick patients like the ones we treat. So look at the low calories. They kept at around 20%, 20 to 25% of the target, 6 kilocalories. We are, if you look at any guidelines, the suggestion is 20 to 25. Here, at the initial phase, they put at a very 6 kilocalories per kg. And proteins, look at the proteins. It's 0.2 to 0.4 grams per kg per day in the restrictive phase in the sickest of the ICU patients. They compared with the standard. Standard is 25 kilocalories per kg. Proteins, 1 to 1.3 grams per kg per day. And this they gave for 7 days. Because if you look at our current understanding, we start low. But we slowly increase it and reach the target dose by day 4, day 5. Here, up till day 7, they kept on a restricted dose. So, primary outcome is to look at the duration of readiness for ICU discharge and 90-day all-cause mortality. These were the primary endpoints. Secondary endpoints, they looked at the infections, GI events, and liver dysfunction. So, these were some of the outcome measures they looked at. When you look at the results, if you see, it's quite a big study, 3,044 patients. 1,521 in the low group, which got 6 kilocalories and 0.3 to 0.5, 0.6 sort of a grams per kg of protein. And 1,515 was standard. If you look at 90-day mortality, there was no difference between the low group and the standard group. There was no difference with regards to mortality. But the second primary outcome they looked is readiness for ICU discharge was significantly less, which means they did the the group which were fed with restrictive group were discharged much earlier, eight days as opposed to nine days, and that did attain statistical significance. But when they looked at secondary outcome, the secondary infections, there was no difference between low dose, but there were other features which favored low group. They looked at GI symptoms, like vomiting was less in the low group that attained statistical significance. And they looked at bowel ischemia was significantly less in the low group as compared to the standard. Liver dysfunction also was less in low, uh, low group. And duration of mechanical ventilation. So the readiness for ICU discharge also was less in low group. Duration of mechanical ventilation also was less in the low group as compared to the standard. So these were some of the positive signals they found in the restrictive group as opposed to the liberal group. So the discussion, I think we need to look into the discussion. What are the prevailing trials? When you look into the trends in previous studies, these are all the studies which has looked into low calorie versus standard calories. And these are some of the studies which have shown that the low groups did show reduction in mortality. But observational studies, in fact, have shown the contrary. What observational studies have shown is if you give calorie deficient feeds, there was a risk in increase in the infections. This was shown in these two studies, but there were no RCTs showing this sort of a trend that you treat with a calorie deficient, there's increase in the risk of infection has not been shown in the randomized control trials. And the target trial also did not show any benefit with increase in the calories at the outset. So these are all some of the studies favoring that restrictive may be good enough. 
you know, in the initial. That's why the first statement that I made, we speed early, but don't speed with the target dose, start low, because these are the studies to substantiate. And uh, very delighted to see the Chapman study, because Marion Chapman is someone whom I work very closely with. And uh, that's come from Australia, where they have shown that low versus standard, low was good enough to, and it had shown some signals towards betterment. That's And as a sequel of this, this nutri raya had come. And Epenic trial is something which looked at early parenteral nutrition versus late parenteral, even there, forget early entrance. So what we are suggesting is nutrition in some format has to be initiated early. Epenic trial showed early parenteral nutrition also reduced the risk of infection, reduced the risk of RRT, reduced ICU length of stay, and reduced the duration of mechanical. So some nutrition all patients have to get very early on is what our submission is. and But the mortalities were similar. So what is the mechanism of this clinical benefit is little unclear, but the suggestion is that autophagy uh, and maintaining the integrity of the muscle function and recovery happens much better with a bit of a restrictive sort of a feeds at the outset is what has been hypothesized. And when anorexic patients develop some sort of an adaptive response and there is increase in the immunoregulatory effect and re reduction in the metabolic disturbance. These are all the physiological hypotheses they have derived as to why uh, restrictive sort of a calorie and protein may have some beneficial effect in preventing autophagy, maintaining the cellular integrity, increasing the immunoregulatory response and reduction in the metabolic response is what has been hypothesized as the possible reasons why early, early restrictive calories and restrictive proteins may have some benefit has been contemplated. And uh, oxygen supply demand ratios will be little better off. So limitation of this nutria is there was no blinding, but the strength of the study was it was a pragmatic design. It was a very large, well, 64 ICUs, multicentric, and it compared standard enteral and uh, parenteral and no overfeeding was there. So the conclusions of nutria was early restrictive calories and proteins, although it did not show reduction in mortality, led to faster recovery, reduced to a the readiness to ICU discharge uh, became much faster and we saw the duration of mechanical ventilation also was lesser in the secondary outcomes and it did reduce complications because the complications were more where they fed with the target calories. The bubble ischemia was more and the vomiting was more and diarrhea was more, so on and so forth. So this was, so there were some signals pointing towards certain benefit with restrictive calories and restrictive proteins at the outset. So did we, did we, so is this the nutria is the gospel? No, after this, there was an effort trial that came. So this effort trial came in Lancet in 2023. So the effect of high protein dosing in critically ill with high nutritional risk, multicentric pragmatic registry based randomized control trial. This is also a big study, 85 ICU in 16 countries, again led by Darren Hayland. 1,301 mechanically ventilated patients, 645 in the high protein group, where they gave a higher protein, and 656 was a low protein. So the patients who were discharged alive from the hospital, if you see, there was no statistically significant difference with regards to mortality between high protein and low protein. But what they found is patients with acute kidney injuries or patients with higher baseline organ failure they had worse outcome with high protein sort of a group. So again, this effort trial also indicates that high protein at the outset or high calories at the outset, especially in, in typical ICU patients who come with AKI or multi-organ dysfunction may not be the way to go and we may have to restrict at the outset. So that's about the myth. So, so the take-home message is any patient who comes to ICU, start early nutrition, ASAP, ASAP. So, uh, so it's a quality indicator that it has to be started within 48 hours as per all the recommendations. But the key message that we wish to give is don't target for the goals that you have with regards to 25 kilocalories or 1.2 grams per kg. Start low and if you look at that step order approach as given, start with 20 to 25 percent of the targets and slowly increase it to reach to the target maybe by day 5 to day 6. Because if you look at these studies, up to day 7, they have maintained restrictive in nutria. So that's the message. So I'll talk about the other myths uh, slowly. So this was the first myth I thought it's little detailed. I'll cover this video. So I request all of you to submit your valuable work to a Journal of Acute Care.
and you can visit my website to refer to this lecture thank you thank you very much